Stanford University. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back for fall. I hope you had an excellent summer. We've got a really fantastic group of speakers lined up for this fall. Uh, I'm Scott Clemmer. Terry Winograd will be here starting next week. I'm just filling in for today. Uh, the speakers this fall include topics of uh, Facebook, creativity, engagement, sense making and search, uh, open government, um, the Chinese typewriter, and interactive body gestures. So it's going to be a really cool fall. Uh, next week, in fact, we're going to have a lot of Adamic, uh, who's from Michigan and is doing her sabbatical at Facebook, which is a really interesting thing for an academic to do. And today we have Ed Cottrell. Ed got his PhD in cognitive psychology and has worked at Microsoft Research for a number of years. And Ed did a lot of research on uh, managing uh, human attention and search. And uh, a couple of years ago, he got interested in technologies for emerging markets. And so he moved to India. And he's going to tell us about the work that he's been doing since moving there. Thanks, Scott. OK, so what I thought I would do today is um, tell you a little bit about um, the group that I work in, and then uh, describe just a few projects that we do, and then hopefully have some time to uh, open it up for a discussion, some questions, stuff like that. So I've got, what, about an hour, yep. basically? All right. So um, again, my name is Ed Kutrell. I work for uh, Microsoft Research India, which is a small lab in Bangalore. And um, this is where I work. So um, it's actually not for much longer. But this is basically where I work. Now, the research lab in MSR India is a fairly typical computer science research lab, if you think about it. Like the kinds of things that we work on, there's a group in algorithms, uh, cryptography, you know, security. Um, there's a group that does um, stuff with programming languages and um, verification. And then, you know, there's this really important group here called the Technology for Emerging Markets group. And that's the group that I manage. I have the great privilege of uh, working with these guys. So what does TEM, Technology for Emerging Markets, do? This is basically our um, raison d'etre. So the first thing we want to do is to understand what people do in um, developing economies do with technology. How do they use technologies? How do they want to use them? How might they use them? The next thing is to take that understanding and translate that into design for systems. And importantly, the design has to be coupled with evaluation. If all you do is build things, then you're kind of empty. You're only halfway there. So we want to be able to close that loop. This is a particularly big deal in um, ICTD, or um, ICTs for Information Communication Technologies for Development, because there's a great deal of hype about the power of technology in these spaces and to do well and do good in these places. The problem is that there has been a very little in the way of evaluating them, of actually studying if they're doing what you say they're doing, and what you believe that they can do. And finally, what we want to do is to collaborate with other folks. These are NGOs, um, governments, product groups at Microsoft and elsewhere to scale anything that we might find. Assuming we do find good, useful technologies in uh, any of our prototypes, we are not in a position to really scale those up. And to have real impact, we need to be able to work with somebody to be able to do that. So this is who we are. It's a fairly small group, and it's extremely multidisciplinary. What we try to do is to go from people to technology and back again. And in order to do that, we have a cultural anthropologist, um, a communications and sociology guy, and Jonathan Donner. He's actually got his PhD here at Stanford in, from comms. Uh, there's Indrani Mehdi, who is a designer. Uh, there's me in HCI. And then Bill Tees, who's uh, really pretty much a hardcore computer scientist. So between this, these folks, we try to be able to close the gap between studying people, creating technologies, and then evaluating those technologies and bringing them forward in a way that's going to get scaled real social impact. 
these are some of the um, places that we do research. Um, you can see it's kind of all over the planet, um, focused on India, not surprisingly, because that's where we're based. But um, Jonathan Donner is actually based in Cape Town, South Africa. And so that also is important for us because it gives us a little bit of, we, we're not so India-centric that way because it's a big planet. And um, in development and social development circles, India is kind of its own special little world. Um, there's some unique constraints about it. And so you need to be able to open your eyes a little more. This is a way of thinking about the work that we do in TEM. So these are our, um, one way of bucketing a bunch of our projects. So um, you can see there's a whole lot of things here. These are arranged from education projects, uh, finance and livelihoods. Um, we have uh, health care. And then two buckets that are not quite in the same way, mobile phones, which is technology, not so much an application area, but that is really critical in um, developing economies for exploring. And then finally, this understanding users are more abstract questions about how people interact with technology, what they do, um, how people use things. They're more study type focused things. So today I thought I would focus on three things. The first is this pen based interface for microfinance. Um, and the second is this broadcast system for an NGO that serves urban sex workers in Bangalore. And then the final one is going to be this voice portal for citizen journalism. Okay? So let's start off. This is um, a project that was headed by Aishwarya Ratan. She uh, won an MIT TR35 this year, so it was very exciting for us. Um, she's a very smart lady. And the interesting thing about Aishwarya is that she's actually trained as an economist public policy person, not as a technologist. Uh, she unfortunately has just left our lab to go work for Yale for an economist. Um, and so we're very sad about that, but I think we can get her back before too long. So this is the question for the study. Uh, and for the, the system. Can a handwritten pen and paper based work process directly generate and manipulate data, uh, digital data? If you've spent any time in the developing world, one thing that you quickly understand is the ubiquity of paper. Paper is everywhere and it's critical for almost every workflow process. In India alone, if you go to any government area, you will see piles and piles and stacks of paper and carbons. Even in a high-tech place like Microsoft or any of the um, uh, tech places around Bangalore, um, Gurgaon, et cetera, you still see tons of paper and carbons. It's just ubiquitous. It's not going to go away anytime soon. And so what we wanted to do was to see, is there a way of adapting technology that can keep the benefits of paper and the ubiquity of paper, and at the same time, get us over some of the problems associated with paper? So here's the domain we're working in. This is in the area of um, self-help groups, SHGs. How many of you folks have ever heard of SHGs? Almost nobody. OK, so there's a few of you. Um, self-help groups are basically small groups of women, almost always. They're usually about 15 to 20 women. They get together, and they pool a lot of their resources to different ends. Sometimes it's social activism. And most frequently, however, it's in um, Finance, so microfinance, et cetera. Banks, basically, they'll pool their capital together. And then banks are more willing to lend to a pooled group of capital because it's a shared risk associated with um, these 20 women, right? And then they can do all their micro lending among themselves. And then they interface with a bank as a unit. So one method of using this is uh, from Pradhan. This is a, uh, an NGO we work with. It's a fairly large, established NGO in India. Um, this is how they, they work. Uh, they start out with the meeting. Up in the upper left, you can see a bunch of women together. They've got a cash box, and they've got one person who is their writer. They record what's going on in the account books. Now, the writer sometimes is a member of the group, but frequently is just somebody that's been hired by the group to keep the books. Because many of these places that we're working with, all of the women are non-literate. So they can't read or write, and so they need somebody to do this for them. OK, so they'll, they'll do their meeting, write down the uh, information in the, in the, in the uh, account book, and they'll keep a carbon copy of that information. That carbon is then folded up and put into a drop box here in the middle. The drop box then, this fellow on a motorbike comes along, 
picks up the uh, form from the, on the, from the Dropbox, and he takes it off to a nearby town where this fellow called the Computer Munchie lives. So this is the CM. The Computer Munchie is basically a dude who is responsible for about 100 of these self-help groups. And he's paid by the NGO to, to keep all of the books on all of them, put them into Excel or into Tally or some other kind of a, um, of a software package. And then he's the guy that then will interface with the banks. Okay? So once he's done that, he enters all this information into the um, computer. And then he prints out another form called the RMTS2, which is then uh, put back on a motorbike, sent back to the town, uh, to the village, and the whole cycle can then continue. This cycle typically takes about a week to complete. So it's about a week for a full, full round tripping. Now that's when, um, that's on good, good time of the year. During monsoon, or when the roads are really bad, it can be two to three weeks before this thing uh, is actually closed because the road's completely impassable. So that's problematic because by the time the women get the information back, there's a significant delay that's already in place. And if there are issues, if there are problems, then they won't know about that for this significant amount of time. So what kind of problems could we possibly have here? Well, suppose you're the computer munchie, and you're filling, you're transcribing the information on this form, and this is what you see. What do you fill in for this, you know, or this? You have no idea what this person has written down. So instead, what you do is you say, I don't know. You put it back in the Dropbox, round trips back to the uh, women, and then they have to clarify what happened. Another thing that frequently happens is that, that in a, these meetings, they'll just skip entire sections. So you'll have a section that's just missing. So again, you have to round trip this stuff. And this can take a significant amount of time. It can be very expensive. It's very inefficient. It's expensive because the women can wind up missing interest payments. They can get the wrong kinds of payments. And it can cost them real money. So this is what we did. We took a, um, a device. It's this little. Um, tablet looking uh, device over here, a clipboard looking thing, that is um, basically what it does is it allows you to put paper on it and use a normal ink pen to write on the paper that's then digitized and processed by this little low power computer. This is a WinCE device, so it's quite low power, inexpensive. It's got a touch screen on it. But the main point is that these uh, individual fields can be synced to fill in individual fields within the application. Okay? So it's a, um, just for those of you who care, the device itself uses um, an inductive type uh, digitizer. So it's actually quite nice because you can write in a fairly thick booklet that you can stick on top of it and it works just fine. So that's what we, what we do. Now one of the things that we did here is that this, um, uh, this form is almost exactly the same as the form that the women were using to begin with. So there's almost no learning involved in using the new system because it's the same thing they've been doing. So we built this and then coupled it with an application workflow that mirrored what we observed when we watched them working in their um, groups. And this allowed us to drop in a piece of technology with almost no change to the way they're currently working. So how does, it, how does it work? Well, first thing, as people um, write down on the paper, this stuff is filled into the forms uh, inside. There is a simultaneous digitization of the entries. Now, one of the really cool things about that is because it's simultaneous, if there are problems in RECO, in recognition of the digits, you can see it right away because it's recognized in the, um, the, the input thing there. And you can correct it as a result. So actually, one funny little innovation thing is, see that black box up at the top right? That's actually a backspace. Uh, so if you, if you touch the pen in that thing, then it will backspace in the uh, digital space there. Um, so OK, once you've got the information in, you process all the entries against a database that's inside. So you can tell if there are problems. You can check for completeness. You can check for accuracy. And importantly, you can also do all the processing of what the current uh, interest payments are, all that information. Then what we do is we hook that up to a little tiny battery-powered speakers. They're the yellow things. And we use a um, speech output to read 
what the current status of everyone's loans are. Okay? So, as I said earlier, one of the really important things that we do in our work is to make sure that we evaluate everything that we build. So we did a fairly extensive set of trials. Um, this is the initial trials. Another one is ongoing now. But for the initial trials, there were three things we were comparing. We compared the standard paper that people were filling out um, that they had been using before, the digital slate, and we also compared it to a touchscreen only system. Now, the touchscreen was basically just using the digital slate we had, but not using any paper. So this simulated pretty effectively what it would be like to use something like a cell phone, like a smartphone, for entry here. You know, one of the concerns that we had is that the um, slate is just a prototype device. It actually isn't manufactured anywhere. So if this is going to be deployed widely, we're going to have to build it and have it, you know, fully um, uh, manufactured. Whereas there are tons of smartphone phones out there. You can get, and you can probably build a, um, an app like this for not even a smartphone, just a little J2ME type phone. So we wanted to be able to compare those two. Um, I'm not going to give you all the details of this um, graph, but the important thing is accuracy improved, completeness improved, efficiency improved. So just yay, good all around. It's excellent. Um, but one funny thing is if you compare the green and the yellow bars over on the left side there, you'll see that they're about the same. So there's not really much quantitative difference in um, efficiency, completeness, or accuracy for comparing the touch screen only to the tablet. So what this is really telling us is that the digital workflow and the, and the process that we've built is helping out a lot for these three metrics. But the paper itself doesn't make much difference. Right? So the workflow is a critical piece. So if that's true, then why would we care about paper alone? And that's where you have to actually start looking at other issues, more qualitative kinds of issues, and talking to the people. So this is some of the survey responses that we did along with this. Um, one of the important things I want to point out, and this is something that could happen with um, a touchscreen, a phone type thing as well, but that we did not anticipate early on was how important the audio output spoken word was for these women. Notice this, this quote here. I like that the machine is speaking. We are illiterate people. We don't know what goes on, but when it speaks, we can know. This gave a large sense of empowerment to the women in the um, self-help groups because now they actually had a solid handle on exactly what they owed when and how. This is a big deal because, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the writers are often not even members of the self-help group. You know, they're just like a kid, frequently, that's been hired in. And so this gives them a sense of trust in the system. The next piece, I think, is really important, which is we must have the kata, the paper form. Now, this is important because what happens in a lot of these spaces is, is um, technology breaks really easily. These are really harsh environments. The people don't have a lot of experience with the technology. And this gave a sense of trust that, OK, fine. You're getting all this information. It's going off to the banks, wherever the heck that is. But I know we have a paper form here that actually shows what I am doing, what I owe, how much I owe, when. And that's going to be there whether or not this random ethereal thing of the um, electronics keeps me together or not. Like I just don't care about that. I've got my paper. And then the final piece, this is for the writer. Now, this is a literate person. And you know, this person says, you know, I can use a calculator, and I've used other people's mobile phones. But writing by hand is habit. I feel it is better. Now, this gives the sense of the fact that it takes, and I've watched us do these trainings, it's almost instantaneous. People pick it up like that. The writing is given some structure in the digital, and it just makes sense. It takes a lot longer to train on a phone or a purely digital entry. All right, so that's the, um, the first project. And um, we can come back to some questions on that, I think, maybe at the end. And we'll just do a big open set of questionnaires. But for now, what I want to do is to move from paper, which is one form of very natural interaction, to something that's even more natural for almost all of us, and that's talking. Uh, most of us have been doing it since we're about two years old. And that's true across the planet. So we want to figure out if there are some ways to leverage that to, um, for the goals that we have in mind. 
So the first of these, I want to talk about the phone itself. Um, if you're just looking at the internet, in India, there's a big problem. Now, this is um, wired internet. Um, digital, there's, I mean, wireless, there's a little more, but it's actually not a lot more. But wired internet was 7% in 2010. Uh, and for a number of states that are more remote, it's down at less than 1%. So if you're trying to reach people in a lot of these areas, you can't rely on the internet itself. Um, there are a lot of other problems with languages, there's power, education, there's a lot of issues here. In contrast, now I'm, this is stuff that you've all heard before, but mobiles are taking over the planet right now. In India, they're, it's well over 60%. This was, um, I wrote this up a couple, few months ago. Um, the other thing that's really important for the populations that we work with is the fact that the instruments are really cheap, the call rates are really cheap, and you, it's all oral. So if you're non-literate, SMS is great, but it's not going to help you out that much when you can talk to somebody if you can't read. Um, the other thing is that cost really does matter. So the cheap instruments and the cheap call rates are a big deal. Um, so the first project I want to talk about this, this is with uh, Nitya Sambasivan. Um, she is um, a PhD student at uh, UC Irvine. And she's done some work with us for a little while. And, and this particular project um, she did last year, and it was trying to understand a little bit about um, how you can work with particularly challenging communities that have ubiquitous technology associated with them. So there aren't very many of these very poor people that all have cell phones. Even in India right now, if you're talking about very poor people, there's a lot of shared technology in place, but there's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. The second thing is we wanted to try to study um, this urban sex worker community because there was a real need expressed by the uh, NGO we were working with. And also because these women, we felt, was sort of an extreme design case trying to work with these folks. And I'll explain a little bit about why that's, that's the case. But that we felt like by studying them, we could also understand something about studying a lot of more challenging um, design cases around the world. So why are we worried about phone broadcasts, first off, for ur urban sex workers? Well, first off, NGOs want to talk with their um, people they're trying to help. Now, this is hard to do because they're migratory. They move around the city a lot. They're extremely wary because in India, sex work is sort of in a gray area of legality. And so they're highly exploited by a lot of different people, and they're very worried about who to trust. Um, the NGO wants to be able to give them information about notifications, about awareness, about um, all of the different things that they're doing for them. And it's very hard to do that when they're all moving around everywhere. Um, so uh, there we go. The other thing about it, though, is that phones are nearly ubiquitous. So every one of these urban sex workers has a phone. And if you think about it for a minute, you'll understand why. It's because it's a necessary tool for their trade. It's the way they can be reached um, to be able to reach any of their clients, et cetera, or you know, the, the people that are uh, pimping for them. So the other thing about them is that they often have multiple phones. And I'll explain why that is in just a minute. So these are some of the design issues here. Um, first off, Many of the women that we're working with lead double lives. So they have families at home, often husbands and kids and other folks, and they don't know that they're um, sex workers. They believe that they're often they're off uh, doing other kinds of things like um, working for house cleaning and things like that. Um, and they, they flip around their identities depending on the time of day. So they have these multiple hats. Um, they also have these multiple devices that help them manage these, these different lives. So for instance, um, they'll have either a dual SIM phone, which is very common, or they'll have a dedicated work phone and a dedicated home phone. Um, the other thing is that um, there are different times that they are working. And if you call them at the wrong time, it can really be problematic. In fact, it can have a um, catastrophic influence in some cases. So 
this is what our main design principles were. First off, we wanted to do a phone-based server-side infrastructure because it needed to all be based in, in the cloud, basically, and um, just be able to call whatever phones they had. It needed to be fully oral, fully audio. Um, we needed to leverage the trust that they had within the NGO itself. Uh, and we needed to make sure that things were very quick. Uh, they had to be anonymous. So we actually had to craft the messages in a little bit of a, of a, a funny kind of way to make it such that if the wrong person picked up the phone, we wouldn't be saying anything stupid. Uh, and I could talk about that a little bit later. But um, and then the final thing is finding a good time to call. So essentially, what, this, what we built was a robocalling system. There's really almost nothing technologically innovative here. Uh, it just would call up people. Now, there was some you know, useful, interesting scripting that we did that was sort of would make it such that individuals are receiving uh, calls that are customized to them at a given time because we needed to worry about particular timings for different people that they could tell us. But we started out with a pilot. Um, we then did a set of things having to do with microfinance loan reimbursements, I mean reminders. So the thing here is that uh, women often, they had a microfinance thing associated with this NGO for the sex workers. Um, the reason they did this, they had set this up, they actually set up a whole lot of things. Originally, the NGO was designed just as an AIDS intervention. And what they found was that the needs for these women was so much larger that if they just tried to, to focus on AIDS, they just lost the women very quickly because there were just too many other issues. So they needed to sort of pull them in with a bunch of their other issues, and then that would translate into a lot of the uh, um, AIDS interventions as well. So microfinance is one of those. People need loans. The problem is that they would often forget their loans. And they would forget to pay them back. And then they would incur interest uh, charges and other kinds of fees. And so they really needed a way to be reminded by this. So that was that one. Uh, HIV testing reminder, that's pretty obvious. And then a computer training session and announcement. This was a fairly large thing that we did that broadcasted out to a large number of the membership. So um, structured interviews, data records, phone logs, a bunch of the standard things you might expect for an ethnographic um, intervention here, I mean, study like this. Well, these are a bunch of the findings that we had. I'm going to quickly go through these. Um, when the women received these calls, one of the interesting things about it is that the call was coming from Microsoft. So it was a number they didn't recognize at all. It was just kind of a random thing. One of the interesting things is they would very frequently, immediately, as soon as the message is over, they would call back Pragati, which is the NGO, and say, I just got this call from Geetha Madam. Um, can you tell me more about et cetera, et cetera? What was going on here, et cetera? And the, one of the nice side effects of this is that it actually even tied the women closer to the NGO. So it was an outreach in which the, the NGO now was even getting a nicer, better relationship with a lot of the women. Um, one of the nice things is that over the uh, couple of months that we did this, listenership never went down. The women always listen to the messages, and they actually listen to almost the entire message most of the time. This is surprising for us here in the West, where you know, as soon as you hear a robocall from you know, Obama or whoever, then you immediately hang up. In this case, no, not at all. But one of the reasons is that they frequently assumed this was a real call. And they, would, they thought it was a real-time call actually from Gita. Um, so these are some of the main findings. Um, when we first had designed the system, we were thinking that we were going to use some celebrities as voices, just to pull people in, you know, use a, a Bollywood star, something like that. And that was the worst possible idea we could have done. Um, instead, by using the, the voice of the head of the NGO, you immediately instilled a certain amount of trust. I know this person. I know she means me well. And I believe in what they're saying. Um, so the final little summary, and, and we can talk more about it later, but in the questions, is that this is something that worked out for us pretty well. And this was a, filling an unmet need among the NGO. And we've seen this in many NGOs now. This is the kind of thing that they really are hungry for, this kind of an outreach ability. Um, the fascinating thing about this particular group is that they're very, very poor, 
but they all have phones. And this gives us a sense as to how this might work in the future when phones are even more ubiquitous than they are now. OK, so more on phones. Now let's talk a little bit about a more interactive system of phones where it's not just calling in. This is um, a little slide that just tells you something about smartphones in India. Right now, it's less than 5% of the total smartphones um, in India. And we're talking about um, probably over a billion smartphones. Um, maybe not quite a billion, but close. Uh, most of the smartphones are feature phones. So those are basically J2ME enabled phones. They have like video players or things like that, music players. Or they're just the dirt basic phone. Um, the Nokia 2100, et cetera. Maybe they have a torch or maybe they have a radio built in. But that's about it. Um, now the problem with using um, mobile systems uh, if you're going to use text, is that you've still got a quarter of the population who can't read. And even those, many of those who can read can only read in local languages. So if you've got a big chunk of people that can only read in Tamil or Kannada or Oriya or one of these other languages, then your phone has to be able to support the text in that, in that language. And then even more problematic is the fact that um, many of the tribal languages don't have any of these kinds of things. So we built a system called uh, CGNet Swara. This is a, um, the point of this system was to try to create a citizen journalism portal for people living in an area that are largely deprived from news. Okay? So this is a um, research with Bill Tease, um, CGNet, MIT, and the International Center, Center for Journalists. Um, we just submitted a paper on this to ICTD 2012. Actually, we just, it just got in, so it's accepted. And um, the idea behind this is to, it's effectively a phone-based wiki system. Okay? So think of it as you call in, you leave some audio story or something like that, and you share it. And then anybody can then call in and listen to everything that's been told before them. Okay? Now, in order to do this effectively, you have to have a few rules, right? So one of the things is that all the submissions are reviewed by, lightly reviewed, by a moderator to just make sure they're legit. Um, this is important because one of the most common kinds of calls we get is breathing. Uh, and, then, and then beyond breathing, you also get a lot of singing. And I don't know exactly why. But something about every, and I've known some other people that have deployed similar systems like this. There's something about India, people just got to sing. And so they do. And so we try to limit that a little bit. So we throttle it down a little bit. Um, OK, but then, then the appropriate content is then published on um, the CGNet uh, site. They're published for playback on the audio channel, so if you can use the phone to listen to everything. And they're also published for browsing on the web and as a seed story for posting on the CGNet site. Now, these last two, you may say, well, you just told me that there's no internet in these places, so why the heck would that be relevant? And I'll explain why it's particularly important in just a little bit. So as motivation, this is a great um, little way to think about things. So qui kuruk gondi. These are three tribal languages or dialects in um, India, in Chhattisgarh. And you can see that there are millions of speakers of these languages. Okay? Now, I want you to look carefully at the little green bar. This is the number of news outlets in those languages. You can see that there is none. These people have no way to get news. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. One of the first reasons is that people who speak this language, these, these tribal languages, tend not to be journalists. And if they are journalists, they're not, they're not reporting in this language. But another reason is that community radio in India, it is forbidden to broadcast news on. So the government can, will only allow broadcast news on government-sanctioned channels. So if you have a community radio system, you can't do it. 
So this makes for a little bit of a problem if um, you're one of the millions of people in one of these areas that don't get um, a, a commercial, I mean, a government radio station. You can't read. You can't read Hindi. Maybe you don't even speak Hindi. So even if you do get a, a government radio station, you're not going to be able to understand it. And it's certainly not going to be relevant to your area, your set of villages and your stuff. It's probably all based back in, you know, um, some big city nearby in a big metro area. So what we did was we provided this system. Um, we've had it now deployed for about two years. So people call in and they tell the stories about their local areas. What's been happening? What's going on? And so the, the main things that we've seen so far is about 40% of all the posts are basically about governance. It's people bitching about the problems that they're getting because they're getting bad governance of various sorts. Um, you can see it's things like NREGA, which is a, a scheme for employment. People don't get paid for in that. Um, issues in land allocation. One of the first big successes in CG Natswara was, um, whoops, um, was that teachers were not being paid. Uh, their, they'd been like six months without pay. This thing came out on the site, and within um, a week of publication, they got their pay. So this was a nice thing that was telling us early on, OK, there's something here, then this actually may be really quite useful. But it's not just about you know, people griping about the government. It's also about other stuff that news is supposed to do. It's the real-time breaking things of, you know, disease outbreaks, um, issues in water supply, problems in people's uh, farming practices nearby. And honestly, you know, I mentioned that about singing earlier, and we were, you know, early on poo-pooing it. But it's something that people really want, and they wanted to listen to it. So we keep that in the mix a bit. People want to sing, and they want to be able to share their singing and their tribal stories and this kind of stuff. And this is a medium for them to be able to do that. So this is a, um, an example of one of the stories that um, was somewhat recent. And it's a very tragic story, honestly. The I, the what happens here is that um, a father, uh, a man, is going around wandering to get his uh, NREGA money. So he's worked his 100 days. He's guaranteed pay by the government for doing this uh, manual labor, and he can't get paid. So he's going from government to government official to official to official, trying to get paid. Meanwhile, his son is really sick back in the village. And the reason why it's so acute that the um, father get the money is because he can pay for treatment for his son. While he's out trying to collect the money, the kid dies. He goes back, and it's very sad. It's a terrible thing. And this is a story about that. The fascinating thing is that within about a week of this being published on CGNet, it shows up on the BBC. And then, a couple of days later, it's in the Hindu and in the Times of India. And these are huge dailies throughout India. Um, there are like millions and millions of subscribers of these things. And this gives you a sense as to the fact that this is would have, what would have otherwise been a tragic event that would have been completely quietly dealt with in the local village has now been broadcast up to the entire country. It's got an enormous amount of feedback back into the local area. I can promise you that some government officials got um, slapped pretty hard around for this. And this gives you a feeling as to the, the, the notion of what a voice can do in these spaces. That the system, you know, as simple as it is, gives folks a sense of voice and a sense of being able to share the problems that they have, both with their neighbors and their friends, as well as the outside world, and to give them outside. This is what I meant earlier by the importance of the site and transcribing this stuff into the CGNet site, because BBC, the Hindu, and the Times of India would not have known about it otherwise, except for by being able to troll this. And now these guys are periodically trolling the site to see the kinds of things that are coming in. So it's giving them this output and this voice. So um, there are a lot of research challenges. And this is part of why I like giving this talk to people like you, is that it's tough. And to make this scale is going to be very hard. You know, some of the problems are usability at scale. If you've ever used an IVR system, you know that they're pretty tough for us. 
and you're all PhD students and professors and whatnot, and you know, it's, but it's actually hard, and you can imagine if you've never used an interactive system before how hard it is then. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of those up there, but they're all really obvious. But the other big issue is for speech researchers. Because this is all audio, you really need to be able to deal with things like language independence. How do you deal with indexing? How do you deal with searching over all this information? How do you, um, as a, um, a consumer of the information, how do you find what you're interested in? Um, and then finally, how do you make this into um, a good social ecosystem? If this is really going to scale, there are three really important things. First off, credibility of reports. You saw that people like to be griping about the government. That's good, but that can also be done quite maliciously for um, you know, just getting revenge on somebody who's done you wrong. So you need to make sure that, in fact, everything's on the level. You also, conversely, need to be able to pr protect the reporter identity. This is an area um, that is a fairly dangerous area right now. Um, Chhattisgarh is full of Naxalite a movement, which is basically a neo-Marxist movement that's actually very violent. And there's a lot of bombings and shootings and all kinds of things like that. Now imagine that you're reporting on some problems in your village and you get targeted by some of these guys. Um, and finally, there's going to be people yelling at each other. Like they're going to be disagreeing. And so how do you manage this kind of conflict among themselves without having somebody step in in a big way? You may not be able to, but that's the question. So um, the final thing is that we're hiring. And so if this looks like something that you would like to do, uh, please talk to me. Um, you know, if you finish your PhD and you're interested in coming out to India for a little while, we also um, have a, um, a really vigorous internship um, process for doing this kind of work. So this is my plug since I'm talking to all of you guys. But more than anything else, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So I'll take any questions you might have or anything else. Yes? Uh, so for that last system, I still didn't quite understand um, how, so if they're communicating all this local information, how are they, if they don't have internet on their phones, for example, how are they receiving it? They call up a system. It's basically an IVR system. They call up, and we do some crude localization, because we know what their number is. And so we can do some crude localization and know where they're from. And we can zero into that. And then we can do a simple you know, DTMF, press 1 for issues about NREGA or whatever. We don't actually do that, but that would be the idea. Yes? Um, you mentioned that there were a lot of people who are only literate in their local language. I know that uh, when I was in Cambodia, there was a phone that was actually entirely in um, Khmer, and uh, it was completely localized, but a lot of people didn't use it. Um, is that phenomenon also elsewhere? Yes. That's actually true in a lot of places. Um, there are phones that are tuned to individual local languages in, in India, in Africa, Southeast Asia, um, China. Um, in, in India, what's very common is people do um, transcription um, of the local language. So you'll see lots and lots of text using Roman um, characters, Latin characters, but um, in basically transcribing into their, their local language. And that's fairly common. Yeah. Struck by um, the choice with the tablet, at, um, you know, to have the paper piece and understanding, and re I, I really do, it resonates with me that fact that, that women using it now, you know, older women would probably feel comfortable and, and the trust piece. And then you think of, um, you know, the XO computer sort of just sitting there and, and kids picking it up and using it seamlessly. and. Is there a transition space or in time that we're looking at with paper being a necessity? Are we, is there the notion that you work with children one way and adults another way? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, the sense that, um, I, I don't think it's transition per se, but, 
but it, there might be that. I mean, one of the things about computers that um, in, in India that I've observed is the keyboard itself is a big hurdle to get over. And this is even true for children. Um, and it, it doesn't, it's just that, that interface of that thing is just difficult. And for someone like me, I mean, I've been touch typing since I was a little kid. And, and that's, to me, I can't imagine getting by without a keyboard. In fact, it drives me crazy. Like, that's something about the iPad that drives me crazy. It's such a terrible keyboard um, for typing. Um, but for, for most of the folks that I work with in India, children or not, the keyboard is a huge barrier. Um, and touch is fantastic. And the direct interaction is fantastic because it's so intuitive. It's directly, it's the way you work with the world. Um, you know, so I, I understand your question. I don't think we have enough data yet to really know. Um, yeah, I've watched a lot of little kids working on computers in uh, schools, low-income kids. And the one thing that they are really good at doing that adults aren't is picking up mice and immediately getting this indirect pointing thing. Like, they just, it just clicks very quickly for kids. And I've watched older people, like, you know, 30-year-old people, just like, it's the hardest thing to watch them deal with it. Because you just want to reach out and grab their hand and say, no, it works like this. But, but yeah. It's not a good answer, sorry. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested in how uh, your group handles, you know, the dealing with the research participants that are sex workers. I mean, dealing with handling their telephone numbers must be, you know, a nightmare because it's a serious human subject issue. And I'm wondering, you know, what are the protocols, guidelines that you guys? Uh... We have sort of some best practices among the group. But one of the um, things about being in Microsoft as opposed to attached to a United States educational organization is that we actually don't have um, to worry as much about, um, like, you know, a human subjects committee. Um, but we do feel a very strong obligation among ourselves to make sure that we have a fairly high ethical bar about how we deal with these things. So in the case of the sex workers, there was one person who was responsible for all of this. And we made sure that the files that were associated with that were all destroyed as soon as the study was done. Um, and that, that that was kept very, you know, s separate from everything else. Um, the, um, the other thing is you had to make sure that any of the women who were receiving the calls, et cetera, would be willing to opt in. And so a lot of this was Nithya going out and hanging out at this, um, the, the drop-in area that the sex workers would come to and just ask them if they were cool with it. And so we were sure that, in fact, they were OK receiving these kinds of calls from the uh, organization. That's a good question. And it's something that ICT4D research in general has massive struggles with is these issues of informed consent, of human subject interaction, et cetera, because um, you know, with a lot of the people we work at, you try to do a standard informed consent form that you're going to read out to them, they will, first off, not have a clue what the hell you're talking about. And second off, you will often scare them away. It's, and you're asking for a signature. You're asking for all this stuff that's actually associated with big, bad government things and all kinds of stuff. And it's just like, no way. Yeah. So well, do you think with this experience, you guys are building up some uh, sort of knowledge base about how you would you know, get consent from these populations, how you would protect that? Because I, uh, I think it's, you know, as you mentioned, a big part of a, a, a piece that's missing in the puzzle of doing you know, research with these areas. And it would be nice if you know, organizations like yours could. You know? We're working on it. Um, we have developed different kinds of these things. Some of them work better than others. And honestly, we don't have a, a, a solution yet. But you know, we're just trying to iterate on it. Um, if you go to the ICTD conference, which is going to be this coming um, spring in Atlanta, this is a big deal there. Um, last year at ICTD in London, it was a major point of interaction, people talking about it. I know of at least two, maybe three papers that are explicitly on this question for this upcoming one. So it's, 
it's something that people are really worried about, and, and a lot of folks are trying to work on it. But I don't, I'm not convinced we have a solution yet. Anything else? All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.